Organizing America, three hours each night. The Rick Smith Show. Back to the Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, thericksmithshow.com. So the Fools game is again back on the table, as I saw the, as we talked about last night with uh, Treasurer McCord about this whole privatization scheme uh, to take away the lottery, to take away the wine and spirit shot, basically anything owned by you and me and the rest of the shareholders in this thing called the Commonwealth. But I saw this story yesterday that a number of these These groups, the Retail retail Federation, the Food Merchants Association, the Business Council, a whole bunch of these really nice business groups saying, hey, we've we've figured out how we're going to divvy up these stores. We've figured out how we're going to divvy up this this asset. And it's going to benefit us. But who's it not going to benefit? Not going to benefit the workers, certainly. And it's not going to benefit you and me, the taxpayers, which is why we've asked Wendell Young, the fourth president of UFCW Local 1776, to come talk to us about this this scheme. Wendell, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, how you doing today? So tell me this they're they're it appears that they're repackaging the same bad idea and saying that they have a different idea. Uh, What's different about this one? Well, in some ways, it's it's very much like uh, the bill passed about a year ago in the House, uh, known as 790, and uh, but it has some different twists to it. Uh, primarily, what, what this really is, is is more complicated, more convoluted than 790. 790, you might remember when uh, some folks tried to describe it when it was up for a vote in the House. Uh, you know, had a lot of fun showing how complicated it was. In fact, it, it was rather embarrassing to watch, you know, John Taylor, Representative Taylor, and the House Leader Terzai, who were both pushing this, uh, and others couldn't even answer questions from members, uh, many of the questions, without doing homework and taking breaks to get the answers. I mean, these, these folks who were key people who helped the, the design the bill couldn't even answer it. Well, this, this one by uh, this business roundtable, we could call it, is even more convoluted but what it really does is it bails out the uh, – one of the things it does is bails out uh, beer distributors who aren't doing well. Um, you know, there's about 1,200 beer distributors in Pennsylvania, and there's about 12 beer distributors at the most. I think it's more like three, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's 12, totaling 1% of all the beer distributors who have gotten behind this bill. And the reason why they have is these are basically beer distributors, like the one – the woman who owns the one called Wet Your Whistle – um, who made bad business decisions. They paid too much for their beer distributor licenses, and now they're losing money or not doing as well as they expected, and they want to get out of the business. And what this particular proposal does is uses the taxpayer money to bail them out by the state buying back those licenses uh, for, for amounts that you know the business may not be worth. And um, so not only... Is this bill, like other liquor privatization, giving away a valuable public asset, um, giving it to a group of retailers for little or nothing, but it also provides taxpayer money to beer distributors who want to unload their business on the state, no, and saw, the state's going to pay them for that. I, I mean, this, that. Is, it's this is ridiculous. You know, think about how Republicans, conservatives, teabaggers screamed and yelled about the bailout of GM. Screamed and yelled. They didn't yell about the bailout of Chrysler back in the 80s, but they screamed and yelled about the bailout of GM. And that was a loan that the government got repaid. This bill is a direct subsidy to the current retailers in Pennsylvania, and it's a direct uh, public purchase of those beer distributors that want to get out of their business using taxpayer money. I look at this though, and again, you know, they keep throwing out big numbers. And 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 aside from this bailout, which caught my attention immediately, uh, in the scheme that you, they, the state was going to buy these licenses back, uh, the the big money that they're claiming seven hundred and seventy million dollars in the first year, and then you read a little bit further on, and it says, well, it's coming from the sale. If I remember right, and help me here, because you're the guy who's the expert. 
didn't they throw out like six billion dollars at one point? Yeah, it's a good point you bring up, Rick. You know, when this first started um, over three years ago, when you know the, the leader Terzai became the leader, uh, Mike Terzai ran around telling people that we were going to get six billion dollars by selling the liquor stores very quickly. Um, within about three, maybe five months, uh, he ratcheted that down to about four uh, billion. Uh, then he started talking about three or four billion, then two billion. Then the governor's study came out in 2011 that analyzed the value of the system under various sales scenarios, and those numbers were kind of all over the place because of the scenarios were different. But you know, most of the scenarios had that number closer to um, you know 800 million, a billion, billion and a half. Um, but under scrutiny, those numbers didn't hold up. So you might remember the fiscal note attached to House Bill 790 a year ago um, from the House Appropriations Committee said about $800 million. Now, here's what's most interesting about that. So this bill, this proposed bill that's being shopped around by these business roundtables is very similar to 790. In fact, they quote the fiscal note from 790 as justification for the $750 million. in the governor's own study, in the evidence provided in testimony, it will cost the taxpayers of Pennsylvania $1.4 billion to unwind the current system. So it's going to cost you $1.4 to shut it down. And you're going to get, if you just take their numbers at face value and assume they're correct, 750 Sounds to me like you'll lose another $850 million somewhere. Uh, And the taxpayers are going to lose day one. And then if you take other evidence presented in the many hearings on the subject over the last three and a half years, we are not going to get the same amount of revenue because you can't sell the same product for the same or even less money and give all the profit to the private sector and still expect the taxpayers to be rewarded. It's not going to happen. So what what you're going to look at is lost revenue going forward because the private sector is going to take the overhead and the profit for themselves. And you're going to lose money day one to the tune of about $800 million if the governor's numbers and if Mike Terzai's numbers are right. So nobody's going to get anything. And here's, here's the, the real dirty thing about the, all this. This whole thing is really a charade. It's camouflage to protect the energy uh, interest here in Pennsylvania. It's no coincidence, in my opinion, that they're floating the same. We could get $750 million right up front, which you can't. If you look at all the evidence, even from those who want to privatize, it'll, it's about a two-year process before you're really going to see any money. And remember, you're going to lose a billion four, a billion point four. But it's about the same amount of money that if this governor would just institute a shale tax, an extraction tax, at about the same level as other similar states, we would take in about seven hundred and fifty million dollars year one in this in, in this next budget year. So this I think is a bait and switch. Let's get rid of five thousand hardworking Pennsylvanians. Let's give away a valuable asset in, for a promise of seven hundred and fifty million instead of just taxing this energy that's our energy, it's our natural resource, tax the people that are taking it out of the ground. Um, the same as other states do, and you can absolutely guarantee getting that same $750 million year one, and it'll go up every year thereafter. This governor doesn't have the intestinal fortitude. When I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia, we had a different way of saying it. We said he doesn't got the balls to do what's right. Right. And that's what we ought to be doing. Yeah, I'm, you know, I've been saying for a while that this is, this is a diversion. This is the shiny thing that's supposed to be taking our attention away from everything else. Uh, you focused on the, the, the energy part of it. Also, the fact that we haven't had a jobs uh, plan. There's no agenda to really uh, fix our schools, to fix our, our, our infrastructure. Rick I, I, Rick, I think you're wrong. He has a jobs plan. But, I, I, you know, he absolutely has a jobs plan. He campaigned for governor the first time out and said that he was going to uh, reduce the size of government in Pennsylvania. The only way you reduce the size of government is you lay people off. He said that despite the fact that Pennsylvania – had one of the smallest workforces of all 50 states, proportionate to our population, and one of the least costly of all 50 states, proportionate 
to our population, despite that, just to pacify and pander to the teabag crowd, he said he was going to make government smart. And he lived up to that commitment. That was his jobs plan. Lay off people that we don't need to lay off just so you could stand on a soapbox and say you did. Okay, well, let me let me let me fix that then. Uh... <laughs> Because you're right. I mean, he has he has lived up to that promise of you know firing twenty thousand education professionals across the Commonwealth. I'm talking about actually creating jobs uh, yeah, that, I know that, you were. I was being that, sarcastic. that have paychecks <laughs> that that increase our economy and then thus pay taxes so our schools can grow and we can have a growing economy uh, instead of what we have we've had the last three and a half years. He has no interest in doing that. He's he's pandering. Our governor is pandering to. You know those ultra uh, wing nuts who, uh, who who have this country in a race to the bottom. You know less people working. You know less better jobs. You, want, you know those people that work ought all work for the least possible amount of money. Uh, so we have a Walmart, McDonald's economy, and uh, you know let's not worry about benefits. Everybody's on their own. Screw the other guy. If I don't get it. They shouldn't get it. Yeah. That's the kind of governor we have in office. Well, the, the problem is he's getting it. He gets a great benefit package. He has a nice salary. He has a great pension. And he gets to jet around in his friend, friend's private planes and go to luxurious resorts without having to get smacked by the ethics commissioner thrown in jail. Yeah, and he's got the house down in South Carolina as, as a backup. Yep. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're here with Wendell Young the Fourth, president of UFCW, Local 1776. Uh, UFCW1776.org, the website. We've got a link at thericksmithshow.com. Just click on Wendell's name. You know, one of the things that caught my attention is uh, I saw this statistic, and maybe you can you can clear it up, uh, that evidently here in the in the, in the Commonwealth, there's uh, one wine, wine store for every 13,000 people. Uh, you look to Ohio, that's like one in 900. Uh, national average, one in 1,300 uh, I look at this and I go, you know, as a parent, as someone who a little socially conscious, uh, I think, do we really want to have that kind of saturation? Because in order for this scheme that they've thrown out to work, uh, I think you have to have a liquor store on every corner. Oh, you do um, for their scheme. Well, first of all, their scheme won't work in terms of bringing in um, uh, a lot of revenue for the state. It won't be that there won't be any windfall because the cost to take the system apart is more than what you're going to get for it. And they all conveniently ignore that. Also, you're not going to get the revenue going forward, but you're right about what's called outlet density. Um, and the, re- the reason that they need the outlet density is because it's the only way they generate uh, some licensing money. Now, it's very simple. It's supply and demand. The more outlets you have, the less uh, costly the licenses will be. And the less costly the licenses will be, the more people will buy the licenses. So, you know, the governor has said, you know, he wants it to be like places he's familiar with where there's a tremendous amount of outlet density. Well, you know, down in North Carolina, near where he has his place, a recent article showed that, you know, one baby, one child dies every week due to uh, alcohol-related accidents. The Marin Institute in California has done one study after another showing that outlet density it leads to increase uh, crime, increased death rates, increase all, all kinds of uh, uh, social problems. Uh, in uh, British Columbia, uh, studies have been done where they've um, uh, measured the change in outlet density as a result of privatization in communities throughout Canada and showed that, you know, you have an increase in, in the death rate of about uh, one person, uh, one additional death for about every uh, 1,000 people or 10,000 people. Uh, as a result of privatization and increased outlet density. And you can go state by state and see similar statistics. You know, when you adjust for drive times, uh, population demographics, and uh, the outlet density for beer, remember, wine and spirits is not the only thing sold in Pennsylvania right. uh, for consumption, and beer by multiples is the drink of choice. So when you adjust for all those things compared to other states, what you have here in Pennsylvania is we have – amongst the lowest consumption of wine and spirits and amongst some of the best stats when it comes to teenage binge drinking and other drinking-related problems. And that's because we have a reasonable outlet density. We have a great set of employees, clerks, my union members, who uh, protect the community by not serving minors, by not serving those who are visibly intoxicated. Um, we do a tremendous 
a, a tremendously good job to help uh, help uh, keep our people here in Pennsylvania safe, and we generate a, a ton of revenue, over half a billion dollars a year. Uh, it's actually over six hundred million this past year uh, that goes directly into the coffers of Pennsylvania in profit and taxes over and above all operating expenses. Um, this is a really good system. It's a very valuable asset. It saves lives. It keeps people healthier, and it generates much needed revenue. Uh, this I hate to sound you know cl- you know like a cliche, but this really is the goose that keeps laying the golden egg. And Mike Terzai and uh, Governor Corbett want to kill it. Yeah, uh, you brought up the license, and and one of the things that I saw in this, and maybe you can clear this up. Evidently, if you own a beer distributorship now, you can buy one of the licenses for ten grand. Uh, to sell wine and spirits. I thought these were supposed to be where all the value was. I thought these licenses were supposed to bring in the the billion dollars or the six or whatever the number is uh, that they'll finally decide on. Uh, they're going to be giving them away for ten grand. Well, uh, yeah, um, you know they'll do that. And so, like, if you were one of these um, restaurants or supermarkets to put a restaurant in or a delicatessen or somebody that spent one hundred and fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars buying a license just to sell beer. And now you find out that, you know, you're going to you're, you're gonna have a competitor down the street for as little as $10,000 being able to sell wine and spirits and beer. I mean, you're going to feel really screwed in the process, uh, which is why I think they have that bailout language in there to bail some people out. Right. Um, you know, I don't think they put a, you know, much, uh, much thought into this whole thing. Um, if, if this bill, if this were to become law, you're going to see most beer distributors go away within about three to five years. That's right. You're going to you're going to have big box stores uh, buying licenses. You're going to have big chains, gas like stations, Sheets, oh, Sheets yeah. Wawa, Rite Aid, Walgreens. Um, you're going to have every supermarket chain getting in on it. Um, you know those folks in those in those other arenas. You know they sell tens of thousands. Uh, some of them up to a hundred thousand more items in their store. They'll be able to take a loss on the wine, beer, and especially beer that they sell. And because a lot of them are big, deep-pocketed chains with far reach, they'll use the, their national purchasing power, and in some cases global purchasing power, to squeeze the prices from the suppliers. They will undersell every beer distributed in the area. They'll sell it at a loss or a cost because they can make up for it on the other items they sell in their store. Beer distributors only sell a couple of things, a few cans of nuts, Mostly beer under this new licensing, maybe a little wine, a little spirits, but that's it. They don't have 30,000, 50,000, or 100,000 other items under their roof to make up uh, uh, the profit if they offer wine, spirits, and beer as a loss leader. And, you know, these, these companies that'll do that, that'll practice in a predatory fashion and put these beer distributors out of business, um, once the competition is gone, then the prices are going to go up. That's what's happened in every other state. They will carve out the market in the short run. They'll close these people down. And under this bill, the taxpayers will pay off the beer distributors who go out of business. What a, what a nice scheme. Uh, let yeah. me ask you a last line of questioning here, because I've yet to come across anyone who goes, gee, I, I really wish we had uh, wine or spirits right there in the checkout aisle next to the Tic Tacs. I don't see the the will or the want of the public to have wine and spirits everywhere. Well, I do see. I do see... A lot of my friends going, you know, I would like to go to the, the grocery store or the gas station, pick up a six pack. I do hear that occasionally, but I've never heard anything saying, gee, I wish I wish we could get get the bottle of Jack with my with my Tic Tacs. So uh, the, the, tr- the truly independent polls, if you look at Franklin and Marshall, Quinnipiac, over uh, more than a year have shown that most Pennsylvanians do not want the system privatized. Uh, in fact, the majority of people wanted it either kept the way it is or improved. Now, you won't hear that from the Commonwealth Foundation. You won't hear it from the Business Roundtable. You won't hear it from Mike Terzai because they just are tone deaf to that stuff. They, they, If it doesn't agree with their talking points, they ignore it. The fact is, polling is that most Pennsylvanians do not want this to change or want it improved in ways that would allow some more flexible hours and um, some enhanced services that right now only the legislature is keeping the system from doing. It's not the PLCB keeping them from doing it. It's the legislature. So um, the point is nobody's having a hard time finding a place to drink or where to get a drink. There are liquor stores in every community, several in some communities. They have reasonable hours. You know, if you can't get in those stores during the roughly 12 hours a day they're open, 
six days a week, then maybe you have a problem and maybe you have a more serious issue with alcohol. Now, convenience, yeah, we can see there should be a little more convenience, which is why with everyone's busy schedules in this world today, we think more of the stores should be open on Sunday. They should have a wider uh, span of hours to be open on Sunday. That's the biggest complaint you hear is people are out on a Sunday. Maybe they're you know, having a little downtime. They're on the way back from getting together with some friends. They want to have a little barbecue at home. And the liquor store closed at 4 or 5 o'clock instead of, um, and they can't stop and pick something up, or they're on the way back from the pool or the beach, whatever it is. We agree it should be more convenient. We think that the procurement system should be streamlined so that the PLCB can move faster to nail down leases either next to supermarkets or even inside supermarkets. We have 20 stores now that are inside of supermarkets. They're very profitable. Uh, they do very well. They're a tremendous convenience to the consumers. They can go with their baskets right from the supermarket into the liquor store, get their things, continue their shopping in the supermarket. doesn't get any more convenient that their space that's they are space that's rented by the liquor control board from the supermarket company and it's owned and operated by the PLCB with you know PLCB employees, our members working them. It doesn't get any better than that. Best of both worlds. You get it under the roof inside the supermarket. And the customers have the most convenient, big selection, great pricing, and the safety and security comes with keeping the state controlling it as well as the revenue. So there's a lot of things we can do. We can do direct shipment um, so, so that, you know, if the right parameters and conditions are met. People, if they want to, can order from a winery what they want delivered to their home. The state gets all the taxes on it. It's only delivered to an adult 21 years or older. Um and there's nothing wrong with that. However, most purchasers would find it's still better to order it through the liquor board because you get a better price. Right. Um, I think we should be able to ship out. You know, we have better pricing than almost every other state in the nation. We can't we can't beat states like Delaware that doesn't charge any taxes at all. But compared to almost every other state in the nation, we have tremendous pricing advantage. Why not ship out to customers all around the country? Imagine the tax windfall for Pennsylvania. On that alone, my prediction is if we would ship out, that just that feature alone within five years would be bringing in a half a billion to a billion a year in additional revenue for Pennsylvania. Why aren't we doing that? How come we don't hear this stuff? How how come we're not hearing this coming out of Harrisburg? Because this isn't about what the consumers want, and this is not about what's good for the taxpayers of Pennsylvania. This whole thing is about taking care of a handful of the, a couple handfuls of private businesses, some wholesalers, some of the big wholesalers who uh, who uh, uh, are brokers, distributors, wholesalers for wine spirits who want to take over the wholesale business because they want the profit that the PLCB is making. And it's about a, hand, a couple handfuls of retailers, uh, Sheets, Wawa, Giant Eagle, Target, Walmart, and a few others who want to get their hands on the licenses so that they can make this money at the retail end instead of the state making it. And it's about a governor and a House leader, Terzai, who want to reward the people who are paying to get them reelected. They want to give them this asset, no different than the lottery deal. It's just the same soup, different bowl. And that's all it's about. And that's what privatization is always about. It's about turning over public assets and rewarding your supporters. That's so, all it is. So we call our legislators, we scream, we holler. What else do we do? Oh, you know, I, 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 I think that's, you know, writing letters, uh, calling into radio shows, uh, emailing legislators, showing up in their district offices, you know, make your voice be heard. You know, they respond to that. They hear that. You said it earlier. You don't have a lot of people. You don't have anybody telling you that they really want privatization. Well, you know, there's a few people that get in their ears, but there's many more that never bring it up. Uh, most legislators tell me that they never hear about this. It's not an issue. So, if you if you want them to hear about it, make sure they know that that you tell them that this is a this is a system that benefits all Pennsylvanians whether they drink or not, and you don't want this valuable asset given away, and you don't want five thousand people needlessly put out of decent jobs just to give some more money to deep pocketed retailers and wholesalers that already have more than everybody else. Yeah, or as Annie wrote me in the email, uh, no effing way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, thanks for the email, Annie. Uh, Wendell, it's great talking with you. I appreciate the, the, the passion. I appreciate the information. Uh, thanks so much.
Hey, thanks for having me on, Rick. Take All care. Right. Let's take a quick break. Back with your thoughts. 1-888-520-RICK. 1-888-520-7425. This is The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. The kids locked in the Capitol are fighting till the end. And we're okay. not going to break tonight. And we're not going to bend. Some say the union's down. But I asked around and everybody said, this is a union town, a union town. All down the line, this is a union town, a union town, all down the line. And if they come to strip our rights away, we'll give them hell every time. This is a union town, a union town, all down the line. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg.